And welcome, welcome, my amazing listeners, to another awesome episode of Lessons from Success. We have a really exciting show today featuring Lauren Bath, who is known as Australia's first professional Instagrammer, and she's built over half a million extremely active followers. Her Instagram success has had her traveling all around the globe and making a huge impact with her incredible photography. On today's episode, she shares some incredibly helpful tips on building an engaging Instagram and monetizing it as well. She also shares tips on what it takes to become a good professional photographer. And towards the end, we honestly share one of the most important lessons to anyone that wants to run a business or live a good life. Now, I had so much fun interviewing Lauren and I honestly cannot wait to see where she further develops her brand. Don't forget to give us a follow at Lessons from Success underscore podcast on Instagram and at Lessons from Success on Facebook as well. Also, feel free to jump online and subscribe to our newsletter at lessonsfromsuccess.com.au. Anyway, that's enough from my voice. Now let's get started on this awesome interview. Thank you so much for coming on today, Lauren. We have Lauren Bath here and she is an absolute Instagram star. How are you today? I'm pretty good. Busy as usual. As usual. Well, thank you so much for fitting us in. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So tell us a little bit about how you got started on Instagram and, and how it's grown to be such an awesome success like it is now. Uh, Long story short, I downloaded Instagram about just over eight years ago now uh, when the platform was still in its infancy. Uh, I started to upload pictures that I took on my iPhone, (laughs) nothing too exciting or creative. Uh, And that kind of got me interested in photography, uh, which, yeah, I I guess I'd never really been into before. Uh, So I did upgrade to a camera quite quickly, started taking pretty nice pictures, I guess, like really trying to work on and improve my photography, sharing this whole journey on Instagram. Uh, That gained me a bit of attention because I was so transparent about the fact that I was learning, uh, asking a lot of other photographers how they did this shot or what settings they used. And that's what started to build my community, that sort of, yeah, that period of me learning and and being interested in photography. Uh, Luckily enough, I was on so early that uh, there just wasn't a lot of competition, I guess. Um, It was still a new platform. Lots of people were joining and looking to find inspiration. And my work, in a way, must have stood out. Uh, A lot of people were still shooting on their phones back then. And when the big growth period hit, which was um, when the Android market came on and when Facebook bought Instagram, Mm. uh, that's when I started gaining crazy amounts of followers, like a thousand a day. Oh, wow. Uh, So I got up to about 200,000 followers uh, within 18 months. Wow. Uh, Was still working. I'm a chef in my previous life. And I was starting to get a few opportunities, uh, tourism boards, very, um, very smart, savvy early adopters, I must add, um, started to reach out, ask me to come and visit, um, do this Instameet. You know, I was invited to Canberra, Hamilton Island, American companies were offering me watches and sunglasses and, <laughs> the standard. you know, the standard, um, <laughs> yeah. but very early. And I, I saw opportunity, but I was at a point where I couldn't keep pursuing that opportunity and working full time as a chef. Yeah. So I made the decision to quit my job. Uh, that was about six years ago now, oh, probably wow. almost to the day. Uh, so I quit my job and decided to pursue travel uh, because that's what I love. That was my passion. Uh, and... Basically, my career began with me emailing tourism boards. I'd find their email addresses randomly on Google searches and just saying, hi, I'm an Instagrammer. You know, <laughs> will you pay me to come to the Wit Sundays and Instagram the Wit Sundays? <laughs> uh, to which everybody obviously laughed and, you know, thought I was joking. But somehow, miraculously, I managed to convince a few people. Yeah, wow. And that was the starting point. That's so cool. When when did you when was your first big sort of gig? When was the first thing where you thought, oh my god, like this is actually something amazing that I'm doing? Uh well it's it's a bit of a funny story because the day that I actually sat down with my boss and told him that I wanted to give my notice, I later checked my inbox and I had three paid opportunities in my inbox <laughs> that literally must have come in within an hour and a half of me. Yeah, actually doing that, like doing the thing, quitting my job. Yeah, wow. um, they were all relatively well-paid, good opportunities that would advance ad- that would advance my career. Uh, but I guess towards the end of the first year, when I started attracting some international tourism boards and clients, was when I realised that yes, it was sustainable. It was a reality, and it was probably something I'd continue to do. That's so cool. Uh, was there was there a sort of a time in your chef career where you thought I'd love to be doing something else, or is it just kind of the Instagram sort of just found you in a way, um, and then you sort of went went down that path? 
Uh, another funny story. Everything in my life has been just strange the way that it's worked out. But uh, I used to live up in Cairns and when I was living up there, I had an entire life and future mapped out for me. I was with a partner, I was working as a chef quite successfully in a job that I really liked. Um, life was good. Uh, and then I went overseas on a short holiday with a friend. And I guess that trip was a bit of a catalyst for me in that it made me realize that I wasn't as happy as I thought I was. Um, my life, the fact that it was mapped out and the fact that, I, I don't know, it's like nothing could change. I decided that that's no longer what I wanted. Um, I broke off an engagement. I left a job that I absolutely loved and I moved back to the Gold Coast with the goal of traveling. Wow. And I, after I made that goal and I moved back, I met my current partner yeah. and I found a great job and I found uh, the chef that worked at that restaurant became my best friend. And I guess things just got easy again and I became complacent again. So it's like I, I had this epiphany and I almost got to like became this person that I wanted to be. But again, sort of some things stopped me and my fear stopped me. And, uh, and then with Instagram, when that all happened and when I was thinking, what could I do with this platform and what career could I make for myself? Travel was such an obvious decision for me because it felt like I'd been getting dragged in that direction anyway. Yeah. And it's like it was like the universe was like fucking here it is. Like, we're not going to give you hints anymore. Like, this is it. Just do it. Yeah, just, just do, do it. it. Yeah, that's incredible. So so you got 200,000 in the first 18 months, which is absolutely, especially for back then, mind boggling. Do you think those sort of, uh, do you think it'd be easier, to, as easy to start now, I should say, than it was back then? Or what What do you see the hardships being now compared to, compared to what it was? Uh, it's definitely harder to get to that level now. But the, the opposite side of that is that you don't need that many followers to do what I do. Mm. So to get to 200,000 followers without cheating, I should really put that in there, without, um, without using any sort of unfair advantages that are available all over the internet, uh, it would be very, very, very difficult mm. unless you were a world-class content creator or photographer. But even then, you know, Instagram is filled with the best photographers and content creators in the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your Chris Burkards and your, all your Nat Geo photographers and, you know, everything's out there. So to compete with that and grow to that extent, very hard. But in order to monetize with Instagram, whatever it is that you're doing, mm. that's not a benchmark you need to hit. If you have even 10,000 followers, but you have decent relationships, great conversations, great engagement on your account, mm. there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't start to monetize that audience. That, that's interesting you say that because I've, I've got a friend with a Facebook page with a lot of followers and, and whatnot, and he's, he's creating a product at the moment. And it's really interesting to see some successful people I know that have done really well on social media marketing and whatnot, and they do only have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 sort of followers, but it's the followers that do follow them, like they'll straight away buy yeah, from them they're and engaged yeah exactly yeah. and it's and that's i guess that's why your instagram especially took my eye like you you just had you know an amazing amount of likes on there everyone was very engaged and to top it off and i would not just say this you have the best photos i have potentially ever seen in my life ah, so and exaggeration you, and you know it's true. <laughs> how, how did you get into photography in the first place did you just literally start taking photos on your phone and go this could be cooler or what sort of happened um yeah, it was, it was definitely a matter of picking up my phone and starting to take pictures, but I downloaded Instagram first. So I downloaded Instagram because I'd read that it was fun mm. and I loved Facebook and I loved the whole social aspect to it. Mm. And I, I really a photo sharing site and in order to have more fun on Instagram and have more, you know, conversations and meet more people, I needed better pictures. So I guess my photography evolved along with my Instagram. Uh, that's when I guess I realized that I did have a good eye for photography um, because not everybody can say, I want to be better at photography and then be better. You know, <laughs> yeah, you do, you do have to have some sort of a natural ability or an affinity for it, hmm. uh, which I did have. Uh, and the, when I did switch over from iPhone to shooting on an actual camera, the main reason I did that was because I was actually traveling overseas to Zimbabwe, mm. uh, which is where my partner's from. And I was just thinking, oh, I don't want to come back with just iPhone shots. You know, I want photos I can develop and print and, you know, put up on the wall. So I want to get a camera so I can yeah, create higher quality images. Uh, I didn't think that I would use that camera to 
create content for Instagram. I thought it would still sort of be a separate thing. Mm. Uh, but once I had that camera in my hands, once I realized the, the capabilities of it and how much more I could do with my photography, there was no going back. I don't think I've posted an iPhone picture on my account in oh, five and a half years. Honestly, no, longer, seven and a half years. How much would it stand <laughs> It would stand out so much if you posted yeah. an iPhone photo now compared yeah. to the other shots you absolutely. have. Like, absolutely. Absolutely pristine. Um, so, so with the photography itself, do you have any sort of, I guess, tips for people to get better? I, I did realize that you had a basic photography course that you have available as well. Um, was there just any, any tips that you could give just the standard person in listening in? <laughs> uh, well... Like, yeah, as you said, I do have a course. Uh, the reason why I developed that, and it is an online course, was because I kept meeting people through my travels that would, you know, start a conversation about photography and then say, oh, I've got a camera, but I never use it. You know, I, I end up just shooting on this thing and, you know, embarrassed chuckle. Yeah. <laughs> and I had that conversation so many times that I was like, shit, like how many people actually have cameras sitting at home that they're too scared to use? Or how many people have these cameras and they're stuck in automatic and they become frustrated because automatic can't give them the shots that they want to get. Mm. So I developed the course for these people because ultimately if you understand how to work your camera, how the settings work, and, and just like the, the main technical aspects to photography, then you can save all of your creative energy for making a beautiful photograph. Mm. You don't have to be thinking, oh shit, like what aperture and I don't understand ISO and stress, 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 like that stuff you just know. That stuff should not even be something you're thinking about when you're taking pictures. It's just in the background. Then you're only thinking about creating better pictures. So my advice to people is always to learn your camera mm. inside and out and learn about exposure so that that's not something that's taking up too much headspace. Yeah. And then getting into the creative side from that. Uh, the best way to get better at photography is to consume a lot of photos Uh anything that you see that you really like uh, take aspects of that and work it into your own style and yeah just never never become complacent and think that you're as good as you can be yeah. you're always learning you're always getting better do you still think there's room for you to get better now? Are you still, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love how humble you are. Like we said offline before the interview, I said how lovely your photos are. And you're like, oh, please. <laughs> They're ridiculous. Anyway. <laughs> God, there's so many better photographers than me. I'm so many. I just, I just, don't, I don't know if that's true. Anyway, I, I think your artwork is basically National Geographic quality, if not better. I honestly do. Very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> so you've just gotten back from one of the most amazing places that you said you've ever been. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? And just basically, yeah, all about it. I'm so curious. Uh, yeah, so I've just come back from Antarctica. Uh, it was my seventh continent. So I've now done all of the continents, which is wow. amazing. Yeah. Um, the job came about because an existing client, a uh, PR agency in Sydney, uh, asked if there were any other places I'd really love to go. And we got talking about one of their clients, uh, which is Aurora Expeditions. And yeah, we just kind of were playing around with the idea of me going down on a trip and it be became a reality. Um, and I went and did, it was an Antarctic and South Georgia odyssey. So it took in both of those places. Yeah. It was about 18 days, I think. And yeah, like I was saying to you before we started the interview, it was just, it's so far surpassed my expectations because even though I've traveled to a lot of remote places and to lots of wilderness places, and I've been to a lot of different countries, it's different going to a place where there's no human habitation at all. Yeah. You know, humans don't live there. The only people that are on the Antarctic continent are generally researchers who aren't there year round or, you know, a small handful that are sometimes for certain contracts. Mm. But it's it's pure wilderness. It's yeah. wild. It's stark. It's raw. It's It's just, yeah... Just amazing. I've sort of, like, even with my Instagram post, which I've just started putting out, mm. I'm finding it really hard to articulate how incredible it was. And all I can really say is, like I'm saying now, like, blah, blah. Yeah. Good. Very good. Some, some things <laughs> but, you just can't put yeah. into words, right? So that's why I'm hoping right. the pictures help to tell the story. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I would say it was the biggest adventure of my life. Uh, I couldn't say it's my favorite destination, I don't think, because I've got so many. Mm. One of my favorite destinations. Yeah. Um, and definitely that something that I would recommend that everybody tries to do in their lifetime. No, I'm, I'm definitely going to try and, try and get around to it. We were speaking offline about how it's incredible with no human habitation, how 
the animals are just so welcoming you can get so close and take those up close photos and that's just it's it's sad in a way because now a lot of animals fear humans which mm. which is quite depressing but on the flip side it's, it's amazing that there is still parts of the earth that are so untouched like that mm. um i i i'm, I'm not entirely sure because i haven't been to it either but i would imagine the galapagos islands to be maybe a relatively similar sort of yeah field i to it. i haven't been there myself but yeah. actually i was talking about uh the galapagos on the boat with a couple of people that have been mm. and they said in a way it reminds them of that as far as the wilderness went but they said antarctica and south georgia were better (laughs) yeah wow okay yeah oh that's a that's a big call (laughs) yeah so let's talk about you as a as a bit of an entrepreneur now so you've when you first started getting your following and you first got a few couple of jobs and all those sorts of things i've noticed now that you've got a you've got quite a few products that you have available to sort of publicize through instagram um did you always just have uh did you have multiple products from the beginning or did you kind of just start with the travel opportunities where they'd pay you as well um and how did that sort of develop uh yeah so i i've actually never called myself an entrepreneur but Mm. it's it's a label that people have given me and i guess like the definition of entrepreneurship is seeing opportunities where none exist Mm -hmm. and in that case yes i absolutely did that um i started my career with the travel jobs uh that was such an easy thing for me to slot into naturally because i knew i wanted to travel Mm. from there I guess my philosophy was to say yes to everything and see if I liked it because I'd come from a background where I'd gone almost immediately from school into chefing and I only knew that world, you know, I had no experience with anything else. So the first time somebody said, uh, would you manage five influencers for us and do like a campaign? I said, yes. The first time somebody said, would you come and present to this room full of bloggers? I said, yes. And from there I started to realize that I am really good at project management um, and I enjoy it. Uh, I have a good business mind and I'm very organized. Um, I do love public speaking and I've since done huge amounts of that. And then looking at ways that I can help people, uh, God, help people and inspire them through travel, through photography, I did start to develop different products um, and services. Uh, One is my conference. Uh, I have a conference called the Travel Boot Camp where we teach people how to get paid to travel. Uh, That wasn't my idea. I had a journalist friend, Georgia, who came to me and said, wouldn't it be great if we had a conference and we taught people how to get paid to travel? Uh, And her, you know, the underlying theory behind it was that an Instagrammer, a writer, a travel writer and a travel blogger would all teach how they did it. Mm. And yeah, we kind of, we guess that most people wanting to come into the industry would be better off if they knew how to diversify because it's hard to just be an Instagrammer or just be a blogger. If you can present two or three or four different things that you can do well, you've got a much higher chance of breaking into the industry. So we started that conference and we've now done five events. Um, The five events that we've done, funnily enough, have all been through organic marketing, um, just basically doing Instagram posts and a couple of MailChimp's um, sort of emails. Oh, that's Uh, so cool. Yeah, so this, this next event that we have coming up this year that we're about to launch, we're actually learning marketing for the first time. So the fact that we've done, we've had five successful events with no knowledge of marketing whatsoever is a bit of a miracle. Absolutely. (laughs) So exciting. Yeah. Exciting to see what happens this year with that. Mm. Uh, The online course again, because people were saying, we don't know, you know, we've got this camera sitting in the cupboard. Uh, So yeah, that was pretty natural for me. Um, And I'm also doing some photography tours this year. Um, And that's a little bit different again in that I was traveling in Zimbabwe uh, a few years back and I was starting to get just these thoughts about how hard it was over there and how much people are struggling and how beautiful the country is and I wish more people knew. And then I went back another time and um, I visited this really incredible place called Boomy Hills and I met a couple of really inspiring people. And then I, yeah, just this whole series of events happened. I won't spell them all out, but basically I was just like, I should really run some tours over here. Like that would really help people. And I decided to do that. And that was a really scary undertaking. It's the biggest project I've attempted to do by myself. Um, And I, I sold it not knowing, well, I released it not knowing if anyone would be interested. Mm. Um, And also it's quite an expensive high end product that I'm selling. Mm. And I sold the first tour out almost instantly with no like little to no marketing and then I was like oh I wonder if I could do a second tour same thing released it little to no marketing and sold the whole tour out so I've got 12 people coming to Zimbabwe with me this year that's incredible and um and yeah I 
that's just given me an idea. If I could get that many, you know, 12 people interested in spending that much money and trusting me yeah. with two weeks of their lives in this crazy country, then yeah. what else could I be doing with, with that sort of tourism? It's, it's incredible what you can do, especially with organic marketing, when you do it, try and build an Instagram based on engagement and everything like that, as opposed to building an Instagram on, you know, either paid followers or whatever mm. it may be it really is a completely different ball game right it's yeah it's incredible and it definitely comes down to passion and mm. i think that people who meet me and people who come to my events and have signed up for this tour and people who buy my online course they can tell just by having a conversation with me that i believe in the stuff that i sell yeah like for me it's not about it's not about money it never has been it's been mm. always about creating this life for myself and also inspiring others to improve and change their lives through the things that I love, which are travel and photography and, you know, sharing and social networks. That's incredible. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of authenticity behind everything that I do. Yeah, no, you can, you can definitely tell, like you can tell in every aspect. It's incredible. Um, (laughs) So let's see, let's fast forward a little bit now. So uh, one, three and five years, where do you sort of see the, uh, your brand growing to, or where where would you like to sort of begin to infiltrate into? Um, It's funny because I did a conference recently uh, with an entrepreneur called Kerwin Ray and a lot of the, a lot of the content that he covers is about having a plan and having a purpose. And I, I've never actually sat down and articulated what it is that I want and where I see myself going and how to get to that point. But intuitively I've done everything right. So as far as um, purpose goes, You know, I never sat down and and thought like, what is my purpose? How do I define it? But I have had a purpose this whole time. So what I want to do, especially this year, like my goal is to actually sit down and get really clear about what my goals are. Mm. Um, I do know that I'm moving away from doing lots and lots of different travel campaigns for clients and tourism boards. Because the travel campaigns, like whilst they were my original passion, they take a huge amount of time and energy for very little financial gain. Mm. And that was fine at the time and for the last six years because travel was my, my main goal. But now my goal is to travel on my own terms. And to do that, I need money and financial security. Yeah. And to have the sort of financial security that I want, that I know can actually change my life, the lives of those around me, and, and maybe even change the world with the 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 projects that I'm passionate about, Mm. you know, I need to be thinking smarter about where I'm using my time. Yeah. So a big part of my uh, strategy at the moment moving forward is to keep pushing my online photography course, reaching new audiences with that, reaching new audiences with my travel bootcamp conference and expanding my business in Zimbabwe with the photography tours. So in the next five years, I see myself having a well-established business in Zim I'm doing regular tours over there, spending more time over there, having property over there, also having property in Australia and having a good quality of life. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd love a veggie garden and, you know, I'd love chickens in the backyard and just more space. And I'd I'd just love to create this really beautiful lifestyle for myself um, Mm -hmm. and be able to run these amazing events that inspire people and have just this tribe of people that really want to do better things with their lives and with the planet. And yeah, like, Amazing stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that's my goal. Yeah, for sure. If you if you could rewind, I guess uh, whether it wanted, whether you'd like to rewind to the beginning of the Instagram start, or whether you'd like to rewind further back to after you've just finished school, is there anything that you'd go back and say to yourself if you had the opportunity to? No, I wouldn't change a single thing. That's amazing. I think you there's lessons in absolutely everything that you do, and it all it all serves a purpose in the end. So I'm very, very happy. Number one, I'm really happy that I didn't get into this career when I was younger because I had the maturity to look at it as a long-term thing. And I have a really different outlook to younger influencers who maybe don't realize that the things they say and do on social media now will be there forever. (laughs) So I know I think everything happened for a reason and I I couldn't rewind and fix or change anything. Yeah. Would you have any advice to someone that is trying to get into the influencer space? Um, For example, if I was to start right now and let's just say I had a thousand followers and I'd absolutely love to grow it in a similar style that you did in terms of building a very engaged audience and and creating a a real hub of people that, you know, love not just myself, but what I do as well. How would you recommend I I start that or how would you recommend I build that? Uh, Well, I think like at the most core level, what you definitely want to be doing is sharing the stuff that you are truly passionate about. Um, definitely thinking about your purpose and what you're on the planet to do. Hmm. Uh, that's sort of number one. Yeah. Once you kind of know that, 
everything that you share and every part of yourself that you put out there sort of has to come back to that. Um, it's all about like influence as a definition is trust and reach. So if you want to be influential so that you can do what I do, um, monetize, work with brands, um, yeah, make money off a platform like Instagram. The first thing that you need is is a large amount of people that trust what it is that you say and do. And in order to entice people to trust you, you have to put yourself out there. And you do that by actually being your authentic self, you know, not pretending to be somebody that you're not, uh, sharing consistently, like really putting yourself out there and having great content that adds value to people's lives, whether it's great pictures of Antarctica <laughs> or whether it's something that makes them laugh or something that inspires them, not necessarily photography. It can be words, it can be recipes, it can be jokes, but whatever it is, think about giving value to these people. Mm. And over time, what will happen as a side effect, not because you want followers, but people will start to be attracted to you. And I think when you come at it from that angle and you grow your audience that organically, you can monetize an anything, you know, anything that you're passionate about. And it's, it's easy. Uh, whereas people that are like, I want to be an influencer because I want to get paid or I want to be famous. I want to be Insta famous. It's a different mentality. And I think it leads to a different sort of career that might not have the longevity of mine. I, I would, yeah, I would absolutely agree. And, and you, you do see it. You see people with a lot of followers and the, the engagement's very low. And yeah, I couldn't imagine they'd be monetizing and you're not sure if it's fake following and, mm. and all those sorts of things, which is, it, it's sad that it got to that stage on the platform, especially for the people that ha have worked harder at it. Because ha have you noticed that it's having a larger following now, I guess it, it, it means less than it used to because of a lot of these, a lot of these things coming on? Or? Um, I, I think there's definitely a lot of competition. Mm. And ironically, I create a lot of that competition for myself by running a conference that teaches <laughs> <Yeah>. people. <laughs> um, That's but the irony, I've, right? I've never looked at it as competition. Um, and I've always given away all of my secrets and, you know, any person who's emailed me in the past eight years to ask me any question on earth will say that I gave them an honest answer. Yeah. Because for me, influencers aren't a commodity. I'm not just, I don't know, I'm not just influencer with X number of followers. I'm me and clients that want to work with me because of my personality, my content, my voice, you know, everything that I stand for they'll seek me out. It doesn't matter if there's a hundred other influencers or a thousand or 10,000 that have the same followers. Mm. It's not them that they want. It's me. Yeah. So I, I never look at the competition. I never compare myself to others. Uh, there's a great saying that comparison is the thief of joy. <laughs> and it's so true. No, it is. You know, if you spend your life on Instagram looking at other people, you know, lamenting the fact that they're cheating and they've got more followers than you, uh, you know, worrying about how unfair it all is. And you're not, focusing and you're not putting your energy into your own brand and your own content and that's that's not going to help your journey at all, not at all yeah. so yeah uh, definitely advice to people is to stick to your lane do what you do put all of your energy into your own business mm. and make it unique to you of course absolutely as well. like i guess that's what a lot of people don't understand there's a million different people out there doing exactly similar things to what everyone else but they're is. not you exactly mm. if you don't have your your own personal unique spin on things very similar to this podcast wow what was the gentleman's name again Ker uh, kerwin ray yeah kerwin ray um he's got a very similar podcast in terms of guests and things like that he's had on to myself yet the personality that we put in is, is so drastically different and and i guess that's what you know you can listen to the same person on three or four different podcasts and you'll get a different a different person every single time just, absolutely just from the way that the interview is done and whatnot what is the most common question you get from people being a being australia's first paid instagrammer i read Yes. Um, mm. Well, my claim to fame is that I was Australia's first professional Instagrammer. First professional, my mistake. <laughs> uh, that, that title was given to me by news.com.au. Awesome. Um, they interviewed me. It was actually um, a bit of editorial for a job that I was on. Uh, they interviewed me and we were talking about Instagram. And the journalist said, so, you know, would you say that you were the first person to do this? And I was like, yeah, like, actually, I think that I was. I've never heard of anyone else doing it as early as I did. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say yes. Mm. And then she she came up with the headline and it was Australia's first professional Instagrammer shares her secrets. And um, and it kind of stuck. That's and it's, a, cool it's a cool claim to fame. Like, yeah. I totally wrote, like, it's actually on my bio as well. <laughs> yes. So, um, so yeah, I, yeah. 
definitely claimed that one. Yeah, for sure. And what was the most common people that... Uh, uh, so the most common are? question is, how did you get so many followers? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and to which your answer would be? To which the answer like is usually a short version of, I was on early, I mm. was really lucky that the platform exploded whilst I was already established and I gained most of my followers in the first 18 months. Ever since leaving your chef career and going out on your own, has there, has there been any major setbacks that you've had to come over or anything that's made you, you know, really freak out during the process or anything like that? Or is uh, it... Any, anyone that runs our own business will tell you that there's daily setbacks almost you know there's always it's always ebbing and flowing there's highs and there's lows uh, just before you arrived today I was talking on the phone with a client and we had a misunderstanding about the brief with images mm-hmm. and I think it all comes down to how you approach it a lot of people would have a phone call like that and it would spiral into you know massive amounts of stress and anxiety but you know, I'm solutions driven. So we've had a good chat. I believe that I have a solution. And if I don't, what's the lesson in it? Because every single thing that happens, every fail in particular, like failing is the best thing that you can do. Every time you fail, you learn a massive lesson from it. And if you're smart enough, you can take that lesson, not sink into depression and give up, but take that lesson and actually use it to make yourself better. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've done throughout my career and what I continue to do. Mm. Um, Something else I'm getting more into um, recently is just trying to be more balanced, trying not to ride the highs and lows, uh, trying to always keep my temperament and my mood and my stress levels really even. Um, and that's helping me a lot because that's something that can, you know, can you, yeah, you bad. can def, especially, you know, running your own business and entrepreneurship. Yeah. You mm. can definitely have the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. So my, yeah, my dream is to just be a lot more level and uh, that's coming down to meditation and good morning rituals and having lost some weight now and getting, you know, getting a bit healthier and eating better. And, you know, it really is a holistic and multifaceted approach to what you do you know if you're not healthy your business will suffer whether you want to admit it or not so yeah definitely trying to be more well-rounded and more grounded and more level what does your morning routine look like at the moment um well it's funny because it's not really a morning routine it's just a bunch of stuff that i try and do every day um one of them is meditation uh helping me absolutely immeasurably i can't even tell you how much that's helping me to Yeah, to learn to manage my stress levels in particular. Do you do like a 20 minute sort of bout? Uh, 10 to 20, it just Mm -hmm. depends. And I'm doing guided meditation um, because I'm quite new to the practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm using Headspace, which is an app. Oh, cool. They're amazing. Yeah. Um, I do affirmations. So all of the stuff that you tell yourself that becomes your story, like, uh, let me think of an example. Uh, I'm not a very good photographer. Mm. Uh, So I've been telling myself for years that there's much better photographers out there than me. And, you know, the work that I do and the tourism work that I do uh, dictates my style. And often I'm on time limits. And I'm I'm kind of making excuses and making this story for why my photography is not as good as I'd like it to be. So now, as a part of my daily affirmations, I say, you're an amazing photographer. So that that's just always every time I'm shooting, I'm like, you are an amazing photographer. And I've got like 20 of them. So all of these scenarios, um, just about changing my story and the stories I've told myself. Um, I also do exercise every day now. Mm -hmm. And at its bare minimum, that's just some sit ups and push ups and a handstand or two if I've got a wall to handstand against. Uh, But I'm trying to do more cardio as well. Mm. And the fourth thing that I do is a gratitude exercise whether that's recording the things that I'm grateful for into a a voice recorder Mm. or actually stopping throughout the day and thinking, wow, I'm really grateful for this thing that I'm doing or, yeah. So those four things are giving me just, yeah, they're giving me a lot. Yeah, they really do. It sounds similar to like sort of the Tony Robbins sort of stuff and those sorts of things where they talk about the affirmations and, mm. and saying everything in a positive light. And that, that honestly changed my life. Mm. Doing, doing everything, like putting a positive spin on no matter what the worst situation could possibly be. Yes. It really has just made, it's made life so much better. It, it gives you that extra burst of energy to get out of bed when the day is tough and, and all those sorts yep. of things. <laughs> I'm pretty lucky. I've, I've always been a positive person. Mm. I call myself an eternal optimist. That's you know, great. Yeah. People constantly disappoint me because I, I think they're, you know, I just always think the best of people, Yeah. Uh, which is a good and a bad thing. But overall, I think it's a really great trait to have. Yeah, for sure. Especially if you can forgive the, uh, the disappointments. <laughs> constantly disappointed <laughs> <laughs> oh no thank you thank you so much so where where can people find you when they want to jump on and, and have a look at all your work and, and all the amazing things you're doing uh yeah instagram's the obvious one if you're interested in photography mm-hmm. um and just you know i put so much of myself on that platform so if you want yeah. to get to know me uh instagram my handle is lauren ep bath 
Uh, that's actually another question I get. Why, you know, why Lauren E.P. Bath? What's the E.P. stand for? It's my middle initials. Oh, so okay. my full name is Lauren Elizabeth Piri Bar. Uh, so Instagram's a good place for that. Um, if you have any inquiries about my work, my services, you know, mm. you want to hire me as a public speaker, you want to download my media kit, you want to see more information about my photography tours, anything like that, go to my website, which is just uh, www.laurenbath.com. That's awesome. And just just so we can dive a little bit deeper into the products and, and things like that that you do offer, would you like to share some of the things like, for example, I know that your Zimbabwe trip is sold out, but I would love to hear more about uh, what, what your plan is for that trip and, and if more things are going to open up and, and those sorts of things as well. Yeah, so on my website, there's actually a page called Photography Tours and mm. there's an expression of interest form. Um, anyone that fills that out will be uh, contacted next time I'm running tours. Mm. Uh, for me, it's not just a an open free-for-all. You know, if you want to come, you can come. Yeah. I have a bit of a vetting process to make sure that the right types of people are coming on this trip that will get the most out of it and... You know, people that are going to be as passionate about Zimbabwe as I am and conservation. Um, there's quite a strong conservation element to the trip. Uh, so there is an expression of interest process in order to get through to the, the next, next round. The <laughs> next round. Um, so, yeah, that's I, I haven't started to plan the 2020 trips purely because I want to run the 2019 tours and see if there's anything I can tweak mm -hmm. as far as logistics go. Yeah. Um, I don't think there'll be much because I have actually run the tour through from start to finish as a research trip early last year mm. uh but yeah uh, photography tours expression of interest form what was the second part of that question uh, the second part of the question was just any other uh, products and services that you have on there just because uh the reason i ask is because a lot of people are extremely interested in photography and on the flip side also extremely interested in building their instagram following through that as well and everyone that i've spoken to that's ever been interested in it which has been quite a number now have said i don't even know where to start i don't know oh. where to begin and it seems to be a, re a very much a recurring theme among people that would like to get started and i'm not sure if that's because of uh, there uh, there's a lack of them looking into it or if I'm not too sure if there just isn't that much out there to help them out yeah or... there's probably not a huge amount out there mm. um, definitely as far as photography goes and I'm not just saying this like my course is different to anything else on the market uh, most photography courses and most even if you go to get a lesson or you enroll in a course like a go into your local TAFE anything like that they don't teach photography the way that I do. Uh, my course has the highest customer satisfaction of anyone on the platform that hosts me, uh, which is Passion.io. They do a lot of fitness and exercise um, sort of online courses. And the people that do it are passionate about it. Like we have this sort of uh, Facebook group in this community and it's actually helped people to get their camera into manual mode and to be really confident. Um, I think something that I bring to the table is the fact that I do have no experience at all. I've never done an online course in my life. So I don't have this preconceived idea of how an online course should be. I'm just thinking logically, how can I break this subject down in a way that will really help people to understand it? And I'm drawing on a lot of the things that happened to me whilst I myself was learning photography as a self-taught photographer. So... That course, if you want to be a better photographer, number one, you need to learn your camera inside and out and understand your settings. Do my course. Mm. Like, it's not even expensive and it will get you to that point. And then you can go away and become a better photographer. Yeah. Um, I am actually currently working on another online course uh, with a photographer, very well-known photographer called Trey Ratcliffe, and it's about how to build your influence. Awesome. So that's um, that's what the travel boot camp obviously teaches or goes into a fair bit of that. But we wanted something a little bit more digestible uh, for an online market. So that's something that should be out pretty soon, actually. Um, we're working on all of the course content at the moment, and I'm hoping within the next month or two that will be on the yeah on the market oh that's cool uh, but anything like that you know anything that i'm working on the main place to learn about it is on instagram yeah you know i'm such an open book on instagram i reply 100 percent of my dms oh, that's incredible. i've always got a link in my bio that's whatever i'm selling whether it's boot camp or my online course or zim tours i've got great highlights um story highlights on my profile and all of my posts are talking about what i'm doing hmm. so if you really want to keep on top of Anything that I'm releasing onto the market, follow me on Instagram yeah. and turn on post notifications so you get my posts as well. Um, website would be the second best place to go to, to see the sort of stuff that I'm up to. For sure. And just quickly on the Zim tours, you spoke about conservation and those sorts of things. Is, is there an element of giving back within those Zim tours that, you're, that you've got there? or? 
Yeah, absolutely. There's a massive element around, I'd like to say mindset. Um, I've been on this really unusual journey for the past even 10 years and it's been quite slow burning but it's starting to really pick up steam where I'm looking at the world around me and just thinking what have we done like why why is society the way that it is why why are we so consumer driven why are we so focused on things that don't matter when there's all these things that do matter that are happening that we don't know about so I'm changing so much and I'm I'm trying to find ways to help people to change as well and to not think that they have to live their life by the book. They don't have to come out of school and go to uni and get a job and get a mortgage and start a family and all this stuff that we're taught to believe is important from when we're young. Um, There is other ways to live. And for me, I've always been really passionate about animals. I've been vegetarian for 23 years. We were talking about it before. Uh, And when I was in Zimbabwe and started to see how huge the problems are around poaching and animals potentially going extinct and, you know, being on the endangered list and the huge problems around human wildlife conflict and why people hunt in the commercial hunting industry and Mm. just like all of this stuff that I started learning uh, made me realise that I, I want to do more to help save the planet or help the planet and I think I can inspire other people to do that as well, to want to do that. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah big big element of that yeah so how how does that sort of so on the on the if i was going to go on the zimbabwe tour with you um do you take people through the conservations and things to see what's happening and give them a lot of detail as to this is this is what's going on this is how we can help fix it or uh there isn't a clear-cut answer to how we can fix it Mm -hmm. um so what i'm really hoping to do and i'll give you a quite specific example because you seem really interested no i am genuinely okay so one of the first activities that we do in zim is to go to a wildlife sanctuary called wild is life um i don't like zoos per se Mm. but genuine sanctuaries that actually house animals that aren't eligible to be released into the wild they've been rescued from an environment and they've been brought into a sanctuary and they're being cared for you know, I, I do support and can get enjoyment from visiting those places. So I'm going to take people to this really, really incredible sanctuary that's called Wild is Life. And it's a beautiful afternoon. It absolutely blows your mind how these animals came to be there, how they've been looked after, why they can't be released into the wild and what all of the issues are around poaching and around conservation in Zimbabwe. Mm. So I'm hoping, and I'm sure that people will walk away from that experience thinking like, wow, this place is amazing. And you know, it's so amazing the work that they do and it's so important to save these animals and I wish I could help more. So from that experience and from those sorts of conversations people will start to have with themselves, I'm then taking them later on in the trip to a place called Boomy Hills. And in Boomy Hills, they lost some insane amount of elephants in the last 20 years. And I don't know the exact exact figure on the top of my head, say 85%. Wow. And they got down to like this small amount of elephants and it was pretty much the writing was on the wall that elephants would become extinct in this area. They just wouldn't be there anymore. Mm. There's already no giraffe. There's already no zebra. You know, there's, there's a huge other story as to why this has happened, which I won't go into. Mm. Um, but I met a man called Nick Milne, and Nick runs an anti-poaching, um, anti-poaching group mm-hmm. um, called Boomy Hills Conservation something. I'll have to look that up. That's okay. I actually in, donate to the them monthly. Notes. I should know that. <laughs> um, but Nick, um, Nick said something that blew my fucking mind, right? Because I'd been to Wild is Life. I'd loved it. I was frothing on it and like, yeah, like save the baby elephant. And, um, and Nick basically said, do you know how much it costs to keep a baby elephant alive in a place like that? And I said, well, no, I've got no idea. And he said, I think it was $10,000 a month. Mm. And he said, imagine what a place like this could do with that money. So he's saying, you know, and I, and I love the philosophy. I love the philosophy. Wild is life. Have this motto. Um, oh, it's like everyone counts. Everyone matters. Um, I forget the exact phrase. We'll put it in the notes. Um, <laughs> but basically their whole thing is that every animal is a sentient being and, and it's a life and it deserves to be saved. Yeah. Whereas Nick is like, 
we don't we shouldn't be worrying ourselves about keeping this odd stray or rescue alive like we have a serious problem on our hands and that problem is that these animals are going extinct so let's look at actual ways that we can stop people from poaching elephants and there will still be elephants around for generations to come sounds like a bit of a greater greater good sort of yeah mentality. greater good yeah. so he and that you know who knows who's right? Is Wild is Life right? Is Nick right? Where should the money be going? Where should we be focusing our energy? Mm. That's not the point. The point is, no matter what idea you have in your mind, no matter what, no matter how firmly it's entrenched in your mind that you believe in something so wholeheartedly, mm. you can change your mind. You can change your opinion. And being fluid and being changeable and being flexible and being able to look at different different situations and change your mind accordingly that's what will ultimately save humankind i believe so i think having these conversations because everybody's going to be so set in their way after they've had that first experience yeah. and hopefully like me they'll have this second conversation and be like whoa yeah what do i do now like yeah what yeah. who's right yeah i don't know there is no right like do we want to kill the the animals that are at wild is life like no obviously no but no. yeah but what do we do so for me it's yeah. not about this is what you should do mm. it's about question everything yeah question everything do what you think is right but be be flexible and willing to change for sure and, and i know it seems a little bit strange talking about this on an entrepreneurial podcast but it, it's it's one of those things where you can just tell the passion behind it and to me if more people started businesses where they have this strong passion behind it if it doesn't have to be animals it can literally be anything it, it can be something that makes money if they'd like just the passion that you have just for the animals and the way that you've created this tour not only to give people the experiences but also give people that that thought in their mind of what do I do now? Mm. These are these are things that big business can't create. The in my opinion, well mm. they can, but they're not doing it well. These are things that you know your regular tour groups aren't creating as well. And this is where this is the space where entrepreneurs like I hear a lot about market saturation and those sorts of things. And if you look at it like let's look at it as a whole, this, the tour market is quite a saturated market, absolutely, and, and especially in Africa as well. There's plenty of tours that you can choose from, but what isn't saturated is a tour that takes you and then leaves you with something after the tour as well, which could be, you know, you could literally change someone's life and have them redirect their path to animal conservation and who knows what that could grow mm. into. And to me, that's that's why I was kind of diving a little bit deeper into this topic because it was, I could tell it was something that was passionate about, and, but it's also, it's a really great lesson to learn back to entrepreneurs and a lot of the people that listen into this podcast, they're like, oh, where do I start on my journey? Or I don't know what my purpose is. It doesn't, you find it. You yeah. find it by doing things. And exactly as you said, you, you left Cairns, you came here and you met your lovely partner, which is, he's, he's from Zimbabwe. He's from Zimbabwe, yeah. Exactly. And <laughs> it's kind of, it's all just sort of, it's all sort of come about in that way. And it's all kind of, it, it just, you know, like finding your purpose is silly unless you're actually taking action. And I just, I love how meeting your partner, going to Zimbabwe, you know, all this has developed into doing something like that. And to me, that's just absolutely amazing. So I know it's a little bit weird, especially for my audience <laughs> going into something like this, but it, it, there definitely is absolutely awesome lessons that you can learn here from that as well. Yeah. And I think like the underlying lesson, even taking away the conservation element, it's that everybody should be changeable and willing to change their opinions. 100%. And it helps, it helps you to understand other people, which, you know, all of these skills are really important in business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, it's strange because you mentioned hunting briefly and things like that. And to me, I, uh, I just do not understand how anyone could hunt. And I know there, I know there's huge irony there because I'm not vegetarian or vegan, but to me, it, it baffles me as to, as to why. And I do remember watching something on YouTube on hunters and they were talking about over there about how they they poach to in order to get the furs and things like that mm. which is then to sell that and feed their family and watching that from a, a completely different viewpoint it's really interesting because you see it from a western world and go he's you know he's killing an elephant mm. what a horrible person yeah whereas that's that's not that's not what's truly there a lot of the time he's not just out to kill elephants because he doesn't like elephants or whatever it may be he's there to try and feed his family and i guess that ties back into the later part of your tour when you when you speak to the man in was it Booney Hills? Booney Hills. Booney Hills. Yeah. Um, when you speak to him there, and uh, and I guess his his direction is well, what could ten thousand dollars a month to a village, for example, yep. do to the poverty there and stop the poaching? And yeah, I I, I don't know. Obviously, you've hit a little bit of a passion there yeah. for me because I, I definitely <laughs> I definitely find it incredible. Well, there's there's no black and white. No. And actually, commercial hunting in parts of Africa, if it's done right without corruption, is sustainable. 
because the underlying issue behind it all is that there's too many humans on the planet and human wildlife conflict is only going to get worse not yeah. better so yeah and, and funnily enough being a vegetarian i'm pro hunting i'm um, not so much trophy hunting well, no. definitely not trophy hunting and yeah. definitely not poaching but the sorts of people that go out once a month or once every few months and shoot a deer and then they cut that deer up and they put it in their freezer and that's the meat that they survive on. Mm. I personally think that that's much better and much more sustainable than going to the supermarket and picking up a random package of meat that's come from a commercially farmed animal that's led a miserable existence. Covered in plastic when you buy the yep. package. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's interesting. But every opinion that I have is able to be changed. Yeah, for yeah. sure. No, and that's a, that's a good trait to have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any last last lessons that you'd like to leave anyone that would love to be in your shoes? Um, anyone that sort of looks up to you? I know, I know you've got an absolutely massive following. A anything, um, not necessarily like on, on building Instagram or anything like that, just something you'd like to share with people that, that are a very active part of your audience? Um, I think in general, uh, Definitely one big piece of advice is to not compare yourself to others. Uh, I think that's huge in business and in Instagram. Uh, I think people underestimate how much work is involved in running your own business or in entrepreneurship. Uh, for me, and I don't, I don't want to glamorize overworking, um, but yeah, I've worked seven days a week, 14 hours a day for basically eight years <laughs> you know it, it never stops you never switch off there's definitely an element of having to work really hard um hopefully within the next year or so i'm going to be moving more into scaling my business and hiring people and delegating and developing some standard operating procedures to take some of the load off me uh, but i'm not there yet so definitely be prepared to work really hard um, and another really good lesson is to not make excuses. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, it's all good for you. You know, you were on Instagram early and you had 200,000 followers. What about me? That's not an excuse. You know, have a look at your account. Have a look at what you're doing. If there's a reason you don't have any followers, it's probably because you're not putting yourself out there. You're not putting the time in. You're not putting the work in. All your content is shit and it's not adding value to anyone. So don't make excuses for what you can't have. Instead, focus all of your energy on working hard, working towards your goals, not comparing yourself to others and just getting it done. Thank you. Those are the best closing words, and it's it's so spot on. If if you're not getting the followers, if you're not getting the listeners, whatever your whatever your platform is, think about how you can add more value. That's it's not them. Exactly. It's you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's not like if everyone hates you, then you are the minority. You have to realize that, and I feel like a lot of people don't. So, yeah. No, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Few few tangents. Very unexpected. Very enjoyable. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning into the show today. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed it and uh, jump over to lessonsfromsuccess.com.au and make sure you jump on that email list so I can notify you as soon as any more shows come out. I'm your host, Bryn Turner, and thank you so much for joining us.